Welcome to our worship from Seal Church, led by me, Canon Anne Labar, and a very happy Easter to you. As usual, the hymn at the end of our service is sung by the choristers of St Martin in the Fields. Grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord of all life and power, who through the mighty resurrection of your Son overcame the old order of sin and death to make all things new in him, grant that we, being dead to sin and alive to you in Jesus Christ, may reign with him in glory, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be praise and honour, glory and might, now and in all eternity. Amen. Our first reading is from St Paul's letter to the Colossians, chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. If you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth, For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. The Gospel reading is from Matthew chapter 28, beginning at verse 1. After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord, descending from heaven, came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothing white as snow. For fear of him the guards shook and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid. I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here for he has been raised, as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples he has been raised from the dead, and indeed he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him. This is my message for you. So they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them and said, Greetings! And they came to him, took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. In the name of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. He is not here, the angel says to the women who have come to Jesus' tomb, for he has been raised as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples. As many of you will know, over the course of this last year, Philip and I each lost our last remaining parent, his father and my mother. They were both in their 90s and not in good health, so it wasn't unexpected or premature, not a complicated bereavement like those I know others have had to deal with. But all the same, as anyone who's been through this will know, a death in the family can be an exhausting business. It isn't all done and dusted in a week or two, not least because of all the paperwork and sorting out that has to happen. Funerals, ashes and what to do with them, legal stuff like probate and practical stuff too, sorting out all the belongings they've accumulated, a lifetime of furniture, books photos, knick-knacks, bits of paper that might have vital information on them, but probably don't. What to give away, throw away, keep. And of course, there's the emotional work too. 
the moments when you think, I must tell mum or dad about that, and realise you can't. The aftermath of a death can take up a lot of head space and a lot of heart space too. Come and see the place where he lay, says the angel to the women, and I think I know what he means and why it matters. When someone dies, we often need to spend considerable amounts of time in the place where they lay, the place we last saw them, the place we still expect to see them, the place in our memories that they occupy. Being in that place can become a problem, of course, if we get completely stuck there, but it's natural to want to spend time there, and it's often unavoidable too, because of all those practicalities that have to be dealt with. The women who were heading for Jesus' tomb early on that first Easter Sunday morning were doing just that. Matthew doesn't mention that they were going to anoint Jesus with spices and oils, though the other Gospels do, but they clearly felt the need to go back to the place where he lay, the place they'd last seen his body, as it was sealed in the tomb. They were sad and frightened, but they'd had a day or so to gather their thoughts, and they knew what they were going to find. Except, of course, that it doesn't turn out the way they, they thought it would. Matthew's account of the resurrection is characteristically dramatic, far more so than the other Gospels. And it's of a piece with the rest of his story. When he tells us about Jesus' birth, for example, it's the story of the Magi, the kings, the wise men that he tells, riding into Jerusalem, announcing that a new king has been born, which not only terrifies King Herod, but all Jerusalem with him, the story says. Not for Matthew a tale of ordinary shepherds, visited by angels on a hillside in the middle of nowhere, an essentially private event. That's Luke's version. And when the adult Jesus, many years later, rides into Jerusalem on a, on a donkey, again Matthew describes a very large crowd greeting him. The whole city was in turmoil, he says. And when Jesus dies on the cross, there's a mighty earthquake which makes rocks split open and tombs burst asunder. Matthew's point is that something is happening through Jesus which will affect everyone, not just his own small band of followers. It's the same with his account of the resurrection. In Mark, Luke and John's Gospels, the stone has already been rolled away unseen by the time the women get there. Only Matthew has it happening in front of their eyes. And they aren't the only witnesses. He tells of guards stationed there by the high priest to prevent any funny business happening. Well, that turns out to be beyond their power, though. An angel descends from heaven, shining like lightning, rolls the stone away and, cool as a cucumber, sits himself down on it. I like to imagine a great cosmic ta-da at that point. The guards quake in their boots and become like dead men. The women don't know what to think. But the angel says to them gently, Don't be afraid. Come and see the place where he lay. He knows that they need to see it, the place where he lay, just as we all would. And what do they see? Well, that's the great surprise, because for all the fanfare and the build-up to that cosmic ta-da, when they look in, they see nothing. No body, no stench, no wounds, no torment, no sad remnant of the person they've loved. Nothing. What's happened? The angel has said that Jesus has been raised, but I don't suppose for one moment the women really believe it until they see it for themselves, and even then they can't make sense of it. They don't know whether to laugh or cry. They leave the tomb with fear and great joy. They don't understand what has happened, and neither do I. But they know that they don't need to linger here anymore. They can leave the tomb 
and go and pass on the news to the other disciples. The story of Jesus hasn't ended with what looked like the terrible full stop of his crucifixion. A new chapter is opening up, the beginning of a whole new story. Their journey to the tomb wasn't wasted. It wasn't a mistake. The loving gesture they wanted to make wasn't wasted either. They needed to come and see the place where Jesus lay to spend time there, just as we do when our own loved ones die. Indeed, if they hadn't been drawn there by love and grief, they wouldn't have seen and heard what they did. But having seen it, they're set free by it to go on into a different future. Bodily resurrection, like that which happened to Jesus, isn't the norm, of course. Jesus' resurrection is unique. But the message it proclaims, that death doesn't have the last word, is for all of us. It assures us that in life and in death we are held by the love of God. That even when all seems lost, nothing is actually lost. There truly is nothing to fear for ourselves or for those we love who have died, because the sting of death, its finality, its destructive power is defeated. And that sets us free to live, to move on from the place where he lay, the places where our loved ones lie, carrying the memories of them with us, treasuring the gifts they've given us, and embracing what comes next with joy and with hope. I'd like to finish with part of a poem by Malcolm Geit, which says it far better than I can. He blesses every love that weeps and grieves and makes our grief the pangs of a new birth. The love that's poured in silence at old graves, renewing flowers, tending the bare earth, is never lost. In him all love is found and sown with him a seed in the rich ground. Amen. Let us pray with confidence as our Saviour has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. As we share the peace, we hold in our minds those from whom we are separated, members of our congregation, our families, our friends. And we remember that in God's hands we are all held together. Jesus said, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Do not let your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Almighty God, who raised Jesus from the dead, and exalted him to your right hand on high, may we know your resurrection power in our daily lives and look with hope to that day when we shall see you face to face and share in your glory, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. May Christ, who out of defeat brings new hope and a new future, fill you with his new life. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen.